So for this last part, we're going to talk about the last two macromolecules. Um, and this next one does not follow that rule where it has monomers connected together. Um, and that's going to be lipids. So lipids are going to be fats and they're going to be insoluble in water. So right away that should trigger in your mind that they're nonpolar, right? Because that doesn't mix with water. Um, so they don't have monomers. They vary about the length of chains that they have. Um, and they're mostly going to be hydrocarbons. Um, so you may have heard of saturated and unsaturated fats. And this picture here is great because this actually shows the two types of fats that are actually out there. So take a look at these and see if you can notice any difference between the top and the bottom ones. So one thing I'm hoping that you're noticing is that the unsaturated fats actually have a double bond here and they have less hydrogen because all of a sudden these hydrogens aren't here anymore. So let's talk about that. The reason that they have that little kink is because of this double bond here. And remember we talked about how carbon has to have four bonds. Well, here if we count around this carbon, one, two, three, four, and same for this one, then it can't have a hydrogen coming off of it because that wouldn't make sense. So that's why it looks like that. So that's a couple of the differences. One is that unsaturated has a kink and a double bond and also it has less hydrogen. Now, if we're talking about their actual composition, you can see here that saturated fats are going to be solid at room temperature. So they're going to be things like butter, animal lard, and that type of thing. Whereas unsaturated fats are going to be liquid at room temp temperature. So um, olive oil, vegetable oil, all those types of things. So that's the big difference between them. And we tend to say that saturated fats tend to cause a lot more heart disease and that type of thing because if you look at them, they're flat like that and they can stack right up on top of one another very easily, which is why they're solid at room temperature because it's like bricks just right on top. These guys that have the kink, it doesn't work and so they're all kind of floating around and that's why it's liquid at room temperature. So you can imagine if you've got this in your bloodstream how easily these could pack up in your arteries and cause some problems. So that's the difference between saturated and unsaturated fats. Now there's a couple of types of lipids that we're really interested in and the first one is going to be fat molecules. And those are going to have three fatty acids and a glycerol. And here's a picture of a fat molecule. You might have heard of triglycerides before if you've ever gotten those tested for like your cholesterol and that type of thing. So you can see lots and lots and lots of hydrocarbons. And everywhere you see a bond here is going to be energy. So fat is really, really great at storing energy. It's even better than carbohydrates. So that's why we store our energy as fat in our bodies. So that's going to be one type. Um, another type is going to be phospholipids. And phospholipids are going to become your best friend in the next couple chapters. And this is what they look like. These are three different renditions of them. I tend to see them like this the most, and that's where they have that little, it looks like a balloon with two strings coming down. And these are going to make up all of the membranes that we have in our system. So like our cell membranes and our um, nucleus membrane, all the membranes of all the stuff inside of the cell. So these are interesting because they have two parts to them. They've got this phosphate group at the top, that's the phospho part of their name, and then they have the lipid part down here. And <clears throat> the phosphate part is going to be hydrophilic, which if you remember means that it likes water, and then the tails are going to be hydrophobic because they're hydrocarbons, and so they're going to be nonpolar and don't want to be near water. So when you put these in water, these are the three ways they can set up. Um, they can make little droplets, they can make droplets with a little hole in them, or they can form this, which is called a phospholipid bilayer. This is what your membranes actually look like. And so don't worry once again, Chapter 7, all about this. So we'll definitely revisit those for sure. Um, the third type are going to be cholesterols. So that's another type of lipid. And we give cholesterol a very bad name because it does cause heart issues and that type of thing. But cholesterol is found in our cell membranes and it's an important component of it. So that means we do need a little bit of cholesterol to maintain that. Does that mean Fleur says um, we should go out and eat a dozen donuts to keep our cell membranes happy? Not so much. But um, you do need a little bit of everything in order to keep your cells healthy. <clears throat> All right, so those are lipids. 
Now this last group here, carbohydrates, are going to go back to following that monomer setup, okay? And carbohydrates, the way you're knowing that a molecule you're looking at is a carbohydrate, is it's going to be carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen with a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So you see here we've got C6H12O6, right? And if we were divide, to divide all those by 6, it would be C1H2O1. And here's that 1 to 2 to 1 I'm talking about. So that's a quick way that you could tell if a molecule you're looking at is a carbohydrate. So we've got the building blocks of them, which are going to be monosaccharides. Monosaccharides are single molecules of sugar, and so an example would be glucose. So remember, O-S-E means sugar. <clears throat> and monosaccharides can either be linear or a ring. And I think I've got a picture. Uh, yeah, these are some of them. I wouldn't really freak out about looking at that. Um, but here is a bunch of glucose right here, and that's in that ring form. Now, when you have two monosaccharides joined together, they're going to form what's called a disaccharide, right? So once again, if we go back to that model of my circles, these are going to be monosaccharides, which is a lovely long word. Sac okay, lots of dashes, but you get what I mean. So those are going to be our building blocks, right? And in between them, another awesomely long word, glycosidic linkage. That's the name for the bond between them. So remember, they have that covalent bond. So monosaccharides are going to be the building blocks. Glycosidic linkages are going to be the name for the bond between them. Okay, so when you've got two together, that's called a disaccharide. So an example of a disaccharide um, is going to be sucrose. Sucrose is your typical table sugar that you have, that you put in your coffee. Then the last type is going to be a polysaccharide, and that means many, and that's going to be anything more than two. Um, and they can be really, really, really big usually, like starch, um, and cellulose is another example. So polysaccharides can have two functions. They can be used for storage or they can be structural. So as far as storage goes, that's going to vary depending on if you're a plant or an animal cell. In a plant cell, it's going to be called starch. And in an animal cell, we store it as glycogen. <clears throat> so glycogen is something we store in our liver, and um, it can give us short-term energy. Then as far as structural goes, structural polysaccharides in plant cells is going to be cellulose, and that's what makes up the cell wall of a plant cell, and that's what makes them kind of crunchy like that. And then in um, animals, the only type of structural polysaccharide is going to be chitin. And chitin is going to be what is used for these. All of the exoskeletons that you see here that make these guys nice and crunchy, um, that's going to be chitin, and that's going to be a structural polysaccharide. So obviously we don't really have that in our bodies, but some animals do. Okay, so one thing I want to point out as well is that um, we cannot digest cellulose very well in our bodies as human beings. And so sometimes we have bacteria in our guts that will help us to do that. Um, if we cannot do that, then we call it fiber. And that's why when you eat a lot of fiber, you're sitting on the toilet because you're just not digesting it and it's going right through you, right? Okay, so those are the four types of macromolecules. And what I thought might be helpful <clears throat> is this little chart right here. And what I did is I listed the different macromolecules that follow those rules that we talked about. So proteins, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates. And then I listed the building blocks that make them up, so the, little, the name for the circles that I drew. So for proteins, they're amino acids. For nucleic acids, they're called nucleotides. And for carbohydrates, they're called monosaccharides. Then what I did is I named their covalent bonds. So proteins, their covalent bonds are peptide bonds. Nucleic acid, the bond is called a phosphodiester bond. And then carbohydrates, it's called a glycosidic linkage. So hopefully that little chart can help you to keep those straight because we'll definitely use those a lot in future chapters. So that's chapters 4 and 5. I hope you enjoyed them. And the next chapter will be about the cell.